flown before. And a daredevil of a different kind. A man who, despite a paralyzing injury, dares to be great. Plus, a French stunt driver attempts to shatter a world record by rocketing his car 300 feet through the air. And stunt cyclist Hans Ray takes his bike for an incredible trip around the world. Plus, daredevil Trevor Cox rockets through a blazing barricade standing on the hood of a car. When I dare you, the... Welcome back to I Dare You, the ultimate challenge. Here's the scene high above the Mojave Desert where skydiver Brady Michaels is about to jump out of a plane and land on top of a hot air balloon. Then he'll climb down the side and end up in the gondola. Can he pull it off? We're about to find out. Our reporter Tyler Harkon is in a helicopter hovering above the action. Let's go to him now. I think Brady is about ready to do it. I can see the balloon. The balloon is at about my two o'clock. It's quite low at this point. It looks like it's really dropping quite quickly. Brady is looking out from the aircraft. I'm not sure. It looks like he's ready to jump, but maybe he's just waiting for that balloon to come down just a little bit. And some technical communication going on inside the cockpit of that plane. I'm right. They're asking the plane to be turned five degrees to the right. I believe he's ready. He's still sitting there. He's got both feet outside. Now he's making a bit of a move here. Looks like he's getting close. Here we go. Brady Michaels is out. He's on his way. The chute is open. And he's on his way. His parachute has deployed. Now remember, he's got to fight through the wind and steer himself toward the balloon. That is no easy task. Brady Michaels is a brave man with quite a mission ahead of him. But thankfully, everything looks normal at this point. I think he's just starting to maneuver into position, gauging things. There's a lot to worry about here. We've got a balloon. It's a moving target. It's moving at the whim of the wind, so to speak. We don't know where that thing's going, and Brady doesn't know where that thing is going, so he has got to really focus at this point. What's he going to do? How is he going to approach that balloon? Brady looks like he's making his move right now. He's coming down. He's coming down awfully fast. He is, this is looking very fast, a lot faster than I expected. I don't know if he's got the control that he wants. It's awful, he's awfully low at this point. Here he comes, he's on the balloon. He is on the balloon and it looks like a dead center hit, an absolute bang on dead center hit. We're coming in for a closer look and Brady is on the can. He's giving me a thumbs up, I'm getting a thumbs up from Brady Michaels. He is absolutely dead center. This is so sweet. I can't believe it. He's celebrating a little bit. We're hitting the balloon right on the bullseye. Okay. But there's no rest yet. We hear him communicating with the, some of the folks in the gondola. Well, the pressure is really on. He's got to get rid of that parachute fast, because if he doesn't, a gust of wind could catch it and send him right over the side. And it looks like he's cut away the chute, but I really can't tell what he's doing. He's got his rope in his hand, but that parachute seems to be sitting on top of the balloon, not going anywhere. I'm really having a hard time making out what's going on. He's on the rappel cord. He's just making a little bit of adjust, a few adjustments here. When he's adjusted on top, you can see a view from the basket underneath. You see those 1,000 degree flames from that propane jet as the pilot tries to keep the balloon filled with hot air. Brady's only got a few more seconds to get off the top of the balloon or it's gonna get awfully hot. Now, if they keep that propane jet off for too long, the balloon will come crashing to the ground. Now, we're gonna swing the helicopter around to get a closer look. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get rid of his parachute. He's got to get that out of the way or else it's going to obstruct him as he comes down the balloon as he's trying to repel. He's pushing it back to 
towards the balloon so he can't get rid of it. This is going to cause a problem because he's going to have to keep going farther down the balloon to kick it off to get rid of it. That creates some danger because as he's kicking it off, it could hook up on him and he could be trapped hooked onto the parachute trying to get into that basket. That's a headache we don't need, and certainly Brady Michaels doesn't need. It seems like that parachute doesn't want to go anywhere, and that's a big problem right now. Who would think that a parachute would, would stick like that? You would think it would just slide off, but it is. There it is, the parachute is free. It is gone, it has passed the basket, and it's on its way down, and who cares? where that thing's gonna land. Brady's biggest concern right now is his balloon, which is wandering into treacherous territory. That's the same rugged mountain range that we saw during yesterday's test flight. Now, this could be a problem for Brady. That balloon going downrange is not something that he wants. Okay, I've got him in my sight now. He's at my 10 o'clock. He's making some good progress down that balloon right now. And he looks confident considering he's hanging at 3,000 feet. Everything looks very good. He's doing it very slowly, very carefully. He looked hung up there for a second, but it seems like he's sliding further and further down that rope. I'm sure he can see that basket from where he is right now. And to Brady, the inside of that basket is where he wants to be. This is where it gets scary. He is now basically very close, hanging outside the basket. That's 20-foot line left. Got 20 foot of line left. Well, he's got 20 feet. He's in a perfect spot on that rope, but he's 20 or 30 feet away from safety, and that is an eternity. And how is Brady going to get from where he is into that basket? The other question, if he doesn't make it, can he get his reserve chute open in time? Well, there's supposed to be another rope that the crew in the balloon was going to use to pull Brady Michaels over to the basket, but now we've learned from aerial coordinator Roger LaRue, who we heard from earlier, that the safety line has been released by the balloon pilot for a safety issue, so they can't pull him in. Brady is on his own. He's only got about 10 feet of line left. He's awfully low. I don't know where this guy gets his strength, how he's holding out. And now the balloon is picking up speed. He's inching down that rope. What's he gonna do next? Brady Michaels hanging precariously over the... Oh, he's let go! Brady has let go of the rope. Now he needs to get a hold with some of the strength that he has left of the ripcord on his safety chute and hand back down. But he's heading towards Earth in a hurry. Brady has had to contend with a lot today, and his day is not over. He's got to try and navigate his way back to Earth. Somehow, he's finding the energy. Remember, those are 75,000 volt power lines. Brady has got to try and avoid those. It looks like he's past the power lines. That's one more obstacle he's gotten through. He's coming down to Earth but I don't know what kind of shape he's gonna be in. We're sending some emergency personnel and some of Brady's own crew out to see him to make sure he's okay. And we're heading over in the camera copter too. As Tyler heads out, let's take another look at that amazing jump. Brady hit the balloon dead center. He got a little hung up in his parachute, but he was able to cut himself free and climb down the rappelling rope. But here's where he runs into more trouble. He reaches the end of the rope, and he's too far below the basket to climb in. I'm out of here, baby! At this point, he bails and opens his reserve chute. But Brady is OK, and Tyler is with him right now. Dude, way to go, man. Ah. Looking good. Nice. What's going through your head right now? Uh, just really stoked. Uh, glad that it went so well this time. Um, had a little bit of uh, hang up with the canopy. It's so funny because it looked like it was going to be a nice clean cutaway because the canopy came down in front of me, but then it was just sitting there. So I'm like, I can't leave it up here the whole time. Tried to bring it off, tried to keep throwing it off, and it was still on the net. And then it started to like track me into the little ditch that my body was making as I was sliding off. So I just 
kept my patience with it, started working it back, and I knew once I got it onto the slippery part of the balloon, it would slide off, and that's what happened. So. A perfect landing. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I don't know if it was perfect, but I'm definitely happy with it. Was there anything going on while you were doing it and you were going, whoa, wait a minute, okay, I gotta fix this. I gotta, I gotta take care of it. Uh, no, not really, but I did take a minute to look around at the beautiful view. It's pretty sweet up there today, man. <laughs> it looks good, but uh, then I said, no, wait, I've got a balloon over here that's going away, let me go after it. But no, it was a lot of fun uh, and certainly a, a huge challenge, and I'm glad that I was able to do it. It was a huge challenge. Congratulations, Brady. Now, let's meet another amazing individual who dared to be great. Mark Wellman was an avid rock climber and outdoorsman until a terrifying fall changed his life forever. The next thing I know, I'm rolling off about a 100-foot cliff, and I landed and uh, felt this tremendous pain in my lower back. Miraculously, he survived the accident, but his injuries were permanent. It was real devastating in the hospital I had a doctor come in and, and bluntly say you're never gonna walk again and I was on the sixth floor and if I could get up get out of bed and get over to that window and jump out I would have but instead of giving up on life Mark dared to meet it head-on he set out to do something incredible I developed adaptive equipment for me to get back on the uh, the cliff again and to set out to climb the largest unbroken granite cliff in North America, El Capitan. For 13 days, Mark and his partner, Mike Corbett, scaled the awesome 3,000-foot monolith inch by grueling inch. The ultimate focus for us was to never give up and never give in, and that's what we did. Since reaching the summit, Mark has gone on to overcome countless other challenges. I love those sports. It's a, a, a sense of freedom. You need to find that passion that drives you. And that's my passion is outdoor adventure. I'm not saying, you know, go climb El Capitan. What I'm trying to say is, what's that El Capitan in your life that you want to conquer? Coming up next, stunt driver Dan Runty launches the world-famous Bigfoot over seven cars and a 75-foot-long tractor trailer. Plus... A car jump ends in disaster when a daredevil tries to shatter a world record. And a German cyclist relives his most death-defying stunts. Plus, a stuntman hangs on for dear life as he crashes through 21 blazing barricades while standing on the hood of a car. Welcome back to I Dare You, the ultimate challenge. Here's the scene in our 40-acre stunt site on the Las Vegas Strip where Dan Runty is about to attempt to fly Bigfoot, the world-famous monster truck, higher and farther than ever before. Here's how it's supposed to work. Dan will race the 10,000-pound Bigfoot at 85 miles per hour down the straightaway and up a four-foot-high ramp. Once he's airborne, he'll try to clear a row of seven cars lined up side by side. Then he'll continue over a 13-foot high, 75-foot long tractor trailer. The ultimate challenge for this mammoth machine. Now let's meet the man behind the wheel, Bigfoot stunt driver Dan Runty. I Dare You reporter Tracy Melshore has more on the driving force behind the most famous monster truck in the world. You, what drives you, no pun intended, to do what you do? Actually, it's it's been a long time coming. I mean, I started out as a kid. We used to used to mess around, jump motorcycles, race motorcycles. I was born and raised on a farm in Illinois. It was it was kind of boring, so we had to make our own fun. It was one of them deals. But what makes a kid want to pursue the life of a daredevil? Just speed. I mean, it was something I've always had to have, and you know, I went graduated from high school and got into the motorsport end of it. Always had a fast car. I mean, I had a 69 Camaro when I was growing up, and it was it was one of the neatest cars I ever had. You know, raced that. Never got caught, thank goodness. And then I got into the monster truck thing. You know, I started out crewing for these guys basically 11 years ago and just never really had a 
point to drive one, but always wanted to drive one. And back, I don't know, a couple years ago, a few of us were doing long jumps, you know, see how far we could jump a truck, a 10,000 pound truck, take it out and hit whatever you could hit and see how far you could jump it. Well, then they started turning it into actually a competition where we would long jump a truck. But Dan's luck took a dangerous turn when Bigfoot flipped over during last month's practice jump. Miraculously, Dan escaped with his life, and his crew had to work overtime to get Bigfoot back into action. Despite the haunting reminder of the crash that could have killed him, Dan is now ready to climb back into his four-wheeled monster and try it again. I guess here we are now, you know, you gotta move up and you gotta be better than the next guy, and here comes the speed thing again. We're just gonna see if we can get over this thing. jump I can feel the electricity building around me Dan and of course you're at the center of this all earlier we saw footage of your unsuccessful test run I've been spending a couple days with you I really like you why do you want to do this again actually it's one of those deals you know it we took a bad bounce the, the truck hit wrong it was just one of them things things didn't work out that day we're it's it's a long story but it's one of those deals where if you fall off a horse you get right back on it we're gonna get back on this horse and we're gonna do it right tonight I mean we're gonna try to anyway and, and and may the best man win, but I'm not going to give up. What about your mom? <laughs> Mom's not in very good shape right now, I know that. I mean, she's a little worried about this, and, and she's told me several times tonight already, uh, can't we just call this a wrap and go home, you know? Is, is there any way out of this, Daniel? You know, one of them deals. She's a little worried about it, but we'll get through this. Site coordinator Jim Kramer tells us that trying to get this 10,000-pound beast up the ramp and into the air takes precision planning. This ramp is all important. This ramp is four foot tall. It sits at about 18.3 degrees. It has to be right. And when he's hitting this ramp at 65 miles an hour, he can't lose a motor. He can't lose a transmission because if he does, he's driving right to the back of this semi. He has to be climbing out here to 80 feet. It's very important that he gets out, gets the clearance, gets the attitude of the truck, apexes about 80 feet out, comes down and lands straight. I don't mean left, I don't mean right, I mean straight because the impact he is going to receive is going to be tremendous. And that impact is going to be tremendous and maybe that's what's going through Dan's mind right now. Moments ago, it looked like Dan was ready, but now he's walking away from his monster truck. He looks pretty nervous, and can you blame him? Considering that crash, he narrowly survived just one month ago. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Is he backing out? We don't know for sure. Maybe he's just trying to get himself psyched up. We'll keep an eye on the situation, but right now, let's check out another amazing jump, one that almost ended in disaster. is France's top stunt driver. His precision driving skills have not only thrilled audiences in more than 80 stunt shows across Europe, Jill has also performed amazing stunts in more than 50 films. Jill was inspired to become a stuntman by his hero, Max Couder, the evil Knievel of France. At the age of 17, Gio began practicing and performing stunts with no real training at all. Incredibly, he turned pro just four years later. Gio has also created a school to help professional drivers deal with all types of hazardous situations. But on this day, all of his skill and experience will be put to the test as Gio attempts the longest car jump ever. Duvain, France. Gilles and his team have constructed a springboard-type ramp. Hopefully, it will give his car the lift it needs to soar farther than 190 feet, the previous world record. With everything finally in place, Gilles walks the ramp and surveys the scene. He's ready to go for it. He climbs into his Ford Capri and makes one pass in front of the crowd, and then it's showtime. Jill roars down the runway at 93 miles per hour. He hits the ramp, but then there's trouble. The car rockets into the air as planned. 
but then it flips. Watch again. Jill's car flies an amazing distance before it comes crashing down. The safety team rushes over. They flip the car, not knowing what they'll find. But they're relieved to discover that Jill is not injured. Take another look at this amazing jump. Jill flies an incredible 328 feet, shattering the original record by more than 100 feet. And now, having survived the car jump of a lifetime, Jill vows to take on even greater challenges. Up next, Dan Runty accepts our challenge to jump Bigfoot over seven cars and a 75-foot-long tractor trailer. And a stunt cyclist takes an amazing trip around the world. Plus, daredevil Trevor Cox rockets through a blazing barricade of flames. When I... We're back with more I Dare You, the ultimate challenge. Out here at our stunt site on the Las Vegas Strip, Dan Runty is daring to accept our challenge to jump the world-famous monster truck Bigfoot over a row of cars and a 75-foot-long tractor trailer. Moments ago, Dan climbed out of Bigfoot, but now he's back and he's taking a few moments to collect his thoughts. He may be trying to erase the memory of his failed practice jump last month. Dan was lucky to be able to walk away from that crash. Bigfoot, however, sustained $20,000 in damage. He's going through his final preparations now. There you see the entire distance that Dan will have to take that monster truck. Keep in mind that the ramp is just under five feet high, and the tractor trailer is more than 13 feet high. Getting the 10,000 pound Bigfoot high enough to clear the truck and all the cars is the challenge. It shouldn't be long now. There's a member of Dan's team walking away from the truck probably just given Dan a few last-minute words of advice. We just got the signal that we're almost ready to go. Dan is revving up Bigfoot's 1,500 horsepower engine. It looks like zero hour has arrived. And I gotta tell you that each time he hits that throttle, we can feel the ground shake all over Las Vegas. And it won't be long now. And he's off! And he's over! He's made it! But, but he's crashed and he's lost a wheel! Well, he made it over the trailer with ease, but the front wheel, the front axle broke off. We're hoping he's okay. The fire and safety personnel are on the scene. Our cameras are moving in. We can see Dan moving inside the cab. It, it looks like he's okay. While he climbs out of the truck, let's take another look at that incredible jump. Check out the height that the truck reached before it came crashing down on its right front wheel. Amazing. There's Dan now, escorted by I Dare You stunt coordinator Joe Scorpin. Let's listen in. Hell of a jump, bro. Man, oh man. That look says it all. Let's go to Tracy. Dan, when did you know you nailed it? Well, I mean, it went pretty straight. It was, it was a little hard going to the ramp. We had to fight it all the way to the ramp. <laughs> back and forth. We made it. It's just, just a tough landing. I mean, it goes down in the front suspension, just won't take it. Broken knuckle. And the knuckle goes, the tire goes, and everything goes with it. Here's a scene from underneath your truck. That's like, actually, you can see how the, the, I'm turning the front steering, you know, to get it straight for the ramp. And, and that's one of the things that, like I said, it was, it was on top. It was trying to hook up. The truck was fighting. I was fighting the truck, and it's just floating back and forth on top of a hard surface, and it's just a hard thing to get a hold of. Hurt the truck bad. What were your thoughts the moment you became airborne? It was, I knew it was up in the air. I mean, I knew it was up in the air. A little fire behind you. I was like, wow, where did that hell come from? That's good. It just it lost it. it was just... And let's take a look at what it looked like from Dan's point of view inside Bigfoot. Wow, what a ride. Now let's take a look from our stratosphere cam. 
can bet they saw this fireball all over Las Vegas. And one last thing. Dan officially jumped 175 feet. And it's safe to say that Dan came out of this better than Bigfoot did. Congratulations, Dan. Next up, take a terrifying trip around the world with the bravest stunt cyclist of all time. Plus, Daredevil Trevor Cox blasts through 21 blazing barricades as he stands on the hood of a speeding car. When Hans Ray has taken his bicycle where no bicycle has gone before. He's ridden up snowy mountains and down skyscrapers, across the world's most rugged mountains and most spectacular beaches. He's jumped over rocks and raced down treacherous stairways. In fact, this pedal-pushing daredevil has biked his way around the planet. The German-born cyclist feels as comfortable on two wheels as most people do on two feet. When I was 12, I wanted to get a motorcycle and start riding one, but my parents thought I was maybe too young, it was too dangerous or too expensive, so I started on the bicycle and I've been doing it now for 20 years. For Hans, bicycling is more than just a hobby, it's a passion. I love bicycles and it really, um, I think it's a, a universal thing, a bicycle, everybody can relate to it. You can go to a third world country and people most likely have ridden a bike before, seen one at least, and it's, it's it's a neat thing um, to be widely accepted like that and have people be able to relate to it. His outrageous bike stunts have earned him an appropriate nickname. I got my nickname No Way Ray when I first came to the States. They always look for challenges and obstacles, you know, which they could like challenge me to and they always said, no way, that's impossible, you can't do that. And when, as soon as somebody said no way, it was for me at least an incentive to try it. So pretty soon they called me No Way Ray and kind of that name stuck forever, I guess. Hans has taken the sport to dangerous extremes. We did this stunt in New Zealand where I rode my bike actually down the side of a 14-story building. And also I was suspended by ropes for safety. I was actually riding my bike, rolling the wheels, and it's a really cool feeling. But at the same time, it's quite scary and it's, it's, a, it's a rush. But Hans will never forget his ultimate alpine adventure. I just did uh, one of my adventure trips last summer in the Alps, and it's quite popular nowadays that people try to traverse the Alps, usually from north to south. They start in Germany and they end in Italy. There's like 100 different routes one can take, and usually people take fire roads and go through the valleys, and I figured, why don't try to ride the most extreme route possible? Han summoned all of his skills to make the trip, and even had to invent a few new moves along the way. There's different techniques to ride your bike in really rough terrain or over big boulders and stuff, and you literally can hop through a field of boulders on your rear tire only without ever touching your front tire, and um, it looks kind of funky, but it's actually very effective, and when you do that, the bike actually becomes an additional body part. His unique talent saved his life during an extremely challenging ride in South America. Some of the more difficult things I've done on my adventures was probably riding on the Inca trails down in South America. But the trails weren't really built for wheels, so they're really rocky and rough and uneven. But rocky roads aren't the only problem Hans faces in his uphill climbs. It's also the altitude that gets hard to breathe and the weather factors. If it snows or rains and you have wet brakes and the brakes might not work very good and you get tired, you know, the, the conditions get very extreme just besides the, the rough terrain you're already on in the first place. And then there are other factors to contend with, like wild animals. The danger is always there and it makes it much worse considering the fact that you're in the middle of nowhere and that you're like far away from any help. But Hans not only gets to learn about faraway cultures, he gets to meet new friends. He especially enjoys entertaining children. I think it's important that the kids can look up to something and have 
fun with something and it keeps him maybe off the street and out of trouble. Han says the benefits of his worldwide bike ride are beyond measure. Traveling, I think, is the best teacher you can get, period, you know. But you learn a lot about yourself and knowing your limits and, you know, you learn a lot of discipline. It's a great thing and you make friends all over the world and, and I think um, you can have fun with a bike and, you know, that's what it's all about. Now let's check out another man who lives for adventure. Daredevil Trevor Cox is about to attempt a stunt that no one has dared to try before. He calls it the Flaming Walls of Death. Trevor's plan is to blast through 21 burning wooden barriers while standing on the hood of a speeding car. It's nearly showtime, so the walls are soaked with fuel, then ignited. A fire crew stands by in case Trevor and his car are accidentally engulfed in flames. Then the driver races toward the walls. The car crashes through all 21 barriers before launching Trevor onto the landing page. Watch again. From inside the car, we can see the flaming wooden beam slamming into Trevor's legs and smashing through the car's windshield. Incredibly, Trevor manages to hang on before he is thrown from the car. But Trevor quickly gets back on his feet, and amazingly, he's uninjured. The stunt is a success. So I planned it. <laughs> it went really well. Having conquered the flaming walls of death, Trevor feels he's now ready to take on any death-defying challenge. It's been an incredible show, but we'll be back next time with more heart-pounding action on I Dare You, The Ultimate Challenge. So for Tracy Melshaw and Tyler Harcott, this is Lee Rearman. Good night, everyone. down on the tiny tropical island. The weather service office in Honolulu forecasts that the eye of Iniki will pass just east of Kauai. 200 mile an hour winds batter the beachfront community, causing a church steeple to come crashing down. The roof of this house tears apart and is blown into neighboring homes. The raging surf pounds its way into people's backyards. Tony Wickman and his family are trapped inside their home. His three small children are terrified. Daddy! Daddy! Not John! Suddenly, the storm escalates into a Class 5 hurricane, the most devastating of all. Tony is afraid that he and his family may not survive. We had no idea it was a Class 5 hurricane to last minute. It just intensified a few hours before it hit land. The fierce wind batters the roof of their house until it rips right off. Now, Tony's home, which has been in the family for three generations, is in danger of being destroyed. That house was, was precious to us. It's an old family home. My grandfather, he was born and raised in that house. Oh, our roof is going. While his wife, Lorraine, huddles with the children, Tony continues to videotape the vicious storm as it pummels their home. My husband was out there laughing hysterically, like he was almost going crazy that we were losing the house. 
But there's a reason why Tony is laughing. The whole sheets are gone already. Wow. Well, the laughter to me was a way to, to cover up um, the fear for my kids. I didn't want them to, th to feel uh, frightened. Tony fears that his family will be crushed to death in their own home. Honey, this whole house is going to go down. Look at the roof already. Just grab things we want right now. I want to grab the TV over there. Oh my God. The ceiling comes crashing down. Now, Tony and his family are in real danger. I ran back down the hallway away from that area because once that ceiling caved in, that wall could have caved in on him or me, leaving the kids in the other side of the house alone. The next day, as Tony surveys the damage, he is thankful that no one was hurt. There's our new hair. There's Vicky. For the Wickman family, their harrowing ordeal has taken an emotional toll. Losing it like that means saying goodbye to all the memories, saying goodbye to Grandpa. So it was sad. It was sad. As they rebuild their home, Tony and Lorraine continue to rely on laughter. Without humor, it would have been impossible for them to weather the storm. Where's Mom? Come here, Mom. There she is. <laughs> Soperton, Georgia. Wayne Cowley and his son Carrie are professional wild boar hunters. Today they plan to catch one using only their trusty dogs and some rope. Wayne knows from experience that each time he comes face to face with a boar, he is putting his life on the line. You have to respect this animal. He can kill you. If he, if he was to get you down, he'd run you. He could cut your legs off. He could cut you stomach out or whatever. Right here. Yeah. Let's go. Wayne and Carrie track their prey along the banks of the Oconee River. It doesn't take long before their dogs surround a small but dangerous boar. Carrie approaches the wild animal with extreme caution. I've been hunting hogs all my life, and every now and then you run up on one hog that is the one hog in a thousand that is a lot worse than the other hog. As Wayne holds the boar by the tail, Carrie struggles to wrestle it to the ground and bind its feet. He is wary of the animal's tusks, which are about two inches long and deceptively sharp. Wayne kneels on the hog's neck to keep its teeth as far away from him as possible. But when he lifts his knee, the animal launches a savage attack. One of its tusks slashes across Wayne's forearm. I had him by the front leg, and I leaned forward towards his mouth, and he reached up in a split second, and it was too late. The blood was pouring. It was so fast, and you about didn't see it. I mean, it was just a, a lightning flash, like a rattlesnake striking. Just a little bit. From the time the hog cut him, he just kind of jerked his arm back and kind of in disbelief, he said, huh, this hog cut me. It just cut me too. The wound is deep and Wayne begins to bleed profusely. He needs help. The men are at least two hours away from the nearest hospital. Fortunately, the hunters always carry a needle and some fishing line with them in case a boar bites one of their dogs. Working without anesthesia or sterilized equipment, Carrie closes Wayne's bloody wound. It hurts to, anytime you stick a needle in anything, but uh, you just grit your teeth and bury it. I didn't have to tape his mouth up, but he was kind of gritting his teeth and growling a little bit. 
Wayne cleans his arm in the river. The emergency first aid job is a success. Although in pain, Wayne isn't about to let this violent encounter come between him and the job he loves. It's just like being addicted to fishing or smoking or drinking, I guess. I don't smoke or don't drink, but I like to hog hunt. So everybody's got to do something that he likes. Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's just before starting time at the Gran Premio de Balcarce race. Driver Maurizio Tucci and his crew are preparing for his run. At the drop of the flag, they're off. Maurizio is at the back of the pack. But as he enters the straightaway, he is about to face the most terrifying moment of his life. Maurizio's car slams into the concrete barrier, catapulting him out of the window and hurling him through the air. Watch again. As the car rolls over, Maurizio flies out and slams against the racer. The impact knocks his helmet off his head. 50 feet down the track, Maurizio's body slams to the ground. Rescuers rush to the scene, expecting the worst. Among them is a friend who is filled with remorse. Earlier that morning, he gave Maurizio his last rites as a sick joke. But he could not have predicted that just a few hours later, his buddy would actually be fighting for his life. Maurizio is seriously injured with 14 broken bones. But by some miracle, he survives. Southampton, England. Boxer Tony Wilson on the left is battling Steve McCarthy. Vicious left hook drops Wilson to the canvas. He gets up. But quickly finds himself in trouble again. McCarthy delivers a lightning fast series of blows that sends Wilson staggering to the ropes. Boxer needs a miracle to save him. And here she comes. Out of the crowd roars Wilson's mother, armed with a high heel shoe. Seconds earlier, Minna Wilson had been sitting ringside, but she couldn't stand seeing her son being pummeled. So she came out swinging. Minna catches McCarthy off guard, hammering him with two quick blows. Officials step in. But Wilson's mother still has plenty of fight left in her as she tries to land one last shot with her shoe. McCarthy celebrates, thinking that Wilson has been disqualified for his mother's interference. But incredibly, the ref orders him to keep fighting. When he refuses, McCarthy is dumbfounded when they award the victory to Wilson. This sparks a violent outburst from McCarthy's fans, despite the boxer's appeal for calm. As for Wilson, he's one tough guy who is happy to be called a mama's boy. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Marcello Bastos takes 14-year-old Luciana Olvera hostage after a failed robbery attempt. For two hours, the suspect keeps police sharpshooters at bay as he uses the terrified girl as a human shield. 
To the kidnapper's surprise, a news cameraman steps forward to document the crisis. The kidnapper orders the cameraman to move closer so he can make his demands directly to the Brazilian president. The cameraman leans in for a close-up when suddenly... He lunges for the gun as the suspect tries to squeeze the trigger. Officers swarm in, putting an end to the standoff. The kidnapper is taken to jail, and the heroic cameraman is showered with praise by the adoring crowd. But the cameraman is not who he appears to be. He is Claudio Falco, a tough police sergeant and army veteran who has trained for emergency situations just like this one. Posing as a news cameraman, Claudio leaps into action. I saw through the camera that it was possible to take the gun away from the guy. When Claudio sees the fear in Luciana's eyes, he is reminded of his own sister, who was recently killed in a tragic accident. She made me remember my sister. She looks a bit like my sister. I can't talk about it. It is the powerful memory of his sister's death that inspires Claudio to act. That moment when he was looking from one side to another, I felt it was the right time to make my move. Claudio struggles with the kidnapper. Luciana is paralyzed with fear as the gun barrel is pressed against her cheek. He tried to shoot, to pull the trigger, you know what I mean? I got scared. In the blink of an eye, Claudio disarms the gunman. Luciana is amazed when she discovers the true identity of the man who saved her life. I thought he was a cameraman. I never guessed that he was a policeman. A short time later, Luciana is reunited with her rescuer. It was a gutsy move. But for this brave cop, it was all part of the job.